What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Random Jam Podcast. This is episode six. We are coming at you live from Dallas, Texas. This is the show where we cover entertainment topics such as movies, TV, music, and more. I'm Reese McKinney. I'm Lane Mitchell. And with us today, we have a special guest. We have engineer, musician, music producer, occasional photographer, Matthew Mobley. How's it going? How's it going? It's going pretty good. So, uh, for those who are who are listening um, and don't know Matthew, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, who you are, what you do, what you like, and uh, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so, like Reese said, I'm a I'm a mechanical engineer. I work at a company that makes medical devices. So, um, I design things that are like tools that are used in surgery um, and intervention uh, that help people. Uh, you know be diagnosed with cancer or go in and actually um, treat various diseases and acute illness uh, so that people can live their life a little bit better and improve their quality of life. Uh, so that's what I do in my day job. Um, and I really enjoy it a lot uh, in my free time. Um, I also enjoy making music. Um, I've written um, quite a bit of, of music, various types. Um, I do my own um, project type stuff where I, I just make music by myself. Um, I've also played in bands in the past, um, but mostly right now what I'm doing is by myself. Um, other than making music, I also really enjoy uh, cycling. So I have gotten into that recently this year. Um, I bought a bike at a thrift store and uh, just kind of went from there. I know. Um, so I, I bought an old used bike and I just started buying parts to upgrade it and started riding it. And I've ridden over 1500 miles this year, which isn't really that much, but it sounds like a lot. And um, it's really just been a great way to de-stress after work and uh, something that I really look forward to every day. That's awesome. So what, what kind of bike is it? It's a Miata 610, which is um, a steel road bike. Uh, most of the bikes that you buy today are going to be like carbon fiber or aluminum, but the older 80s road bikes are steel, and I like that more. It's um, it's brown, which is a weird color, but I like that too. Nice. So um, one of the things that I've been wanting to, is a bike for sure. Uh, I haven't really <laughs> ridden one in a long time, but uh, I know it's a really great great hobby and uh, fun to do. So hopefully one day I can get a bike and, and take some uh, trials around the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I'll just get a Harley Davidson. Um, I don't need leg power, I need engine power. My legs are strong enough, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but yeah, um, so Matthew, uh, as we keep going here, how, how has life been for you um, basically since like March or when this quarantine due to the pandemic happened? Uh, how has that been for you? Um, how has things been different? How has things been not different? Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, so I think that life has been different for pretty much everybody this year, especially. Um, for me, quarantine um, affected me in that we all had to start working from home at my job. So um, they sent me home with a laptop and I got set up and we uh, were doing tele telecommuting. Uh, so I was doing all my work from home and for the most part um, that wasn't a huge issue because I'm able to do the majority of my work on my computer itself um, but it depends on where we are in a project and sometimes I actually need to be at the facility in order to move things around you know th do things build things stuff like that so it got to the point in my project that I was on where it was making it really difficult to keep working from home uh, because I really needed to be at the plant and doing things. So um, right about the same time, uh, the numbers, the cases started to go down and people started to feel more comfortable with releasing uh, workers back to facilities and stuff like that. So they said, okay, you can come back and work at the plant again. Um, just you have to wear a mask every day. And so I've been going to work every day, wearing a mask and working on site. Um, overall though, I would say that working from home um, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. I really thought that I would have liked it because I'm really much a, a very big introvert and I like to stay home. Um, going to the office, though, it seems like it was something that I needed because um, I kind of got, um, you know, a little sad, a little bit like, I wouldn't say depressed, but I definitely felt um, just down more. Yeah. Uh, 
And I think that just getting out of the house and having that routine was something that I took for granted. And I'm, I'm glad to have it back now. So that's, that's really good, though, that you're back in the office. I'm still working from home. And, and I know Elaine, he's got his, his uh, he's working every day, just about uh, in person. But um, it definitely changes the whole vibe of your, your work process and the, the workflow working at home compared to working in the office and having other people around to kind of bounce ideas off of or can quickly communicate. So, but that's good that you're back in it and, um, yeah. and that things are, are picking up and that hadn't, hadn't been any big issues coming out of this. Right. Yeah. So actually fun fact, I, I got COVID. Well, it's not, it's an unfun fact. Um, <laughs> I would recommend getting it, but I had to self quarantine, uh, this past, basically the past two weeks. Um, and it was a different atmosphere, like, oh, like, you know, at first I was like, okay, I needed some rest. But then I was like, man, I just am about to lose my mind staying at home, not having human interaction with, you know, just coworkers. And the, the minute I got back, I was like, yeah, I miss this. This is like, you know, it's definitely, it's a lot different just being by yourself, not doing anything versus, you know, being productive with, especially with your coworkers. So that's, yeah, it's totally a different atmosphere for sure. Right. Um, so so from from that, um, as we're kind of talking about 2020 in general, uh, the way that this year has been, um, what are some highlights or even some maybe some lowlights, which, I mean, you kind of mentioned COVID, so that's kind of a low light there. But, but what are some of the highlights and the, the best things that have come out of the year for you guys uh, as we are kind of coming towards the end of all of this? Yeah, so – for me, man, it's been like a roller coaster. Um, I mean, started off the year, Danielle and I went on the cruise, uh, came back to literally, I mean, we got back, like we slid into home, like barely safe, like, because the minute we got back, like, the craziest thing we realized, oh, this is for real, is we had to go to the store to get toilet paper, like we legit needed it, and it was out, and we're like, what the heck, like, what has happened? This is ridiculous. Like, we legit needed it, so we had to go, like, buy it from Choncho down the road for like 15 bucks. I was like, well, you know, we needed it. Um, so going from that, from a cruise to realizing, oh, this is serious. Um, also to, I left one of my jobs to pursue another job at a broker firm. And after a month they shut down. And I was like, wow. I was like, well, <laughs> what is happening to where then a Chick-fil-A grand opening happened. And we just so happened to hit it off with the owner. And he was like, yeah, I want to like treat you and Danielle really well. And I was like, the guess this was a blessing in disguise it was god's plan and uh and then since then it's been you know biscuits and gravy until i actually got covid so like i said it's been up and down up and down but i think it's starting to level itself out and everything's working working well now in my favor that's really good what about you Molly? i think uh the highlight of my 2020 was at the beginning of this year um i got to go to colorado and learn to snowboard uh, which is something that I had been wanting to do for, for a really long time. And um, I went I went to Colorado whenever I was a little kid, like maybe three or four years old, and I uh, did ski school for children, you know, so I remembered none of that. Um, <laughs> and I went back to Colorado this year for the first time, and um, I took up snowboarding and had lots of fun doing that. So. Snowboarding is great. Go, go, what did you say there? Uh, snowboarding is great. I got to do that for a few years in high school and college. Um, really fun stuff. Yeah. It's not easy yeah. to learn, for sure. No, like, it's especially not, not if, there's no, if there's not any snow, it's really hard to do. <laughs> exactly. I mean, have you ever tried to snowboard without snow? I haven't. I am embarrassed to say I have. Um, so you learn from, you know, real, you know, real application. So. <laughs> Sometimes you got to learn things the hard way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, for me, um, so a low light was definitely uh, getting my Disneyland trip with my family canceled literally the day before they shut down Disney World or Disneyland, um, which I've mentioned a few times on this show. But that was like the one big vacation we were looking forward, forward to and uh, it was back in March. So it was kind of like still up in the air of whether we could go or not. But then we kind of had no choice once they finally – shut it down. So it's like, well, that's done. And then here we are, you know, six or seven months later. And, um, you know, the, the biggest thing I would say, like the highlight would, uh, would have to be going on an anniversary trip with my wife, um, 
over to Oklahoma. So something like super simple and close nearby um, over near the Beaver's Bend area. I got to spend a whole weekend down there and just kind of be away from everything, away from all of the, the news, away from just all the, the madness going on. Um, and that was really neat to kind of just be out in the woods uh, camping uh, in a camping in a cabin, um, but kind of you know putting the phone away, putting away everything that you know, this year has brought to us, uh, and just kind of experiencing you know the outdoors and being there with each other and um, it just all the things that come with that. I think that that was probably the best thing to come out of this year um, was just that that much needed vacation that I didn't get to get. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, if you haven't been to that area, I highly recommend it. It's really, really cool. A bunch of little small towns that kind of surround the Beaver's Bend Park. There's a lot of things you could do like hiking and shopping and a lot of good food there. Uh, shout out to the Grateful Dead Pizza. We had that like two or three times in a row. It was that good. But, um, or Grateful Head, sorry, not Grateful Dead. That's the band. Um, so. Right. Which, I mean, they're good too, though. So don't yeah, discredit can, them. If you can eat Grateful Head pizza and then listen to the Grateful Dead at the same time, then I think you've you've reached another level. So yeah, that's that's a piece. Kind of sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, so yeah, that's 2020 for you. So yeah. on, a scale, on a scale of one to ten, what would you rate this year? <laughs> Ooh, uh, I'd have to say two out of ten would not recommend to a friend. Okay. <laughs> But I mean, they had us in the first half. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. So right now, I'd say it's a it's a six or seven because I mean now the holidays are coming up, so I mean people are starting to get excited. Right. And yeah, the scale could go up or down depending on you know how how it's been. But definitely, yeah, it started out as a two, and it's definitely gotten better. What about you, Molly? Scale one. I'd say this year this year's been about a five out of ten. Five out of ten. Yeah. yeah five. That's fair. Middle of the road. Does anybody wish that they had bought the extended warranty uh, back in January? Um, no. <laughs> okay. There's no fixing this. Exactly. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Definitely not a factory defect, I would say. Well, no, my luck, I would have got the extended warranty, went in and be like, oh, I, that actually expired a month ago. And be like, oh, great. <laughs> well, that's perfect. So... All right. Well, we're going to hop out of the doom and gloom and go into the fun stuff. So uh, now we're going to move into the topic of movies and TV. Uh, the way this works is we're going to go around and each talk about a movie and then go back around and talk about a TV show that we've either watched recently or we really love and we're going to share it with the group. So, um, Lane, what do you have for us? Yeah, so um, my movie is actually called The Trial of the Chicago 7. Uh, it's on Netflix right now. It came out very recently. Um, I think it's a good movie to watch right now because it's very topical uh, because of all the election stuff going on. Um, in a way, it kind of highlights that, but not really at the same time because it talks more about a, an actual event that happened back in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, basically, I'll just say some of the main uh, actors in there. Uh, you got Eddie uh, Redmayne. Uh, he's from Les Mis, Theory of Everything. If y'all seen those movies, he's a really good actor. Um, it reminds me a lot of you, Molly. He's, he's very soft-spoken in the movie, but when he does talk, you're like, dang, this dude is, he's a badass. <laughs> so you'll, you'll really appreciate him. I'll be need to go watch Next it. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, and then you got Joseph Gordon-Levitz, which everyone knows. Um, he didn't actually play, he played a supporting role, but it was very minor. But he did a really good job at his part. Um, then you also got, I always pronounce, mispronounce this dude's name. It's uh, Sako, or yeah, Sako Baron Cohen, uh, the dude that plays Borat. Yeah, yeah. Borat, yeah. Uh, Borat you know. Uh, what else? Uh, Talladega Nights, even Dick, uh, the dictator. Um, <laughs> he was really funny in it. He so basically, without getting too in depth in the movie, there's three main groups that are put on trial for uh, trying to, uh, you know, fight for their beliefs. And what it is they go to the Democratic convention and they're trying to do a peaceful protest, but of course it gets at, way out of hand and turns to a riot. And uh, throughout the movie, it kind of like jumps back from the courtroom back to you know, when the riot, like everything that happened through it. And uh, yeah, his character was hilarious because they led like the yippies, which is the youth hippies. And uh, some of the stuff they do in court, they just are like the very far left, like just way out there, like 
crazy activists and uh they like even dress up like the judge one day and the judge is like what is going on and they're just like nothing your honor and like, he's like do you have clothes in there he's like sure and they take it off and then they're just wearing police suits <laughs> it's just like oh my god like these guys are gonna like everyone looks at them like they're gonna get them you know in so much trouble but uh yeah so you got them you had the black panthers that were involved obviously um and then uh the I forgot what it was like sdm stands for like, it's basically the student-led movement which is eddie uh eddie main's character red main's character um and so it's just crazy to see how it all goes down and how uh the judge even kind of has his own thoughts and beliefs that he pushes on it it's like you know what i i don't you know, you, and then you look at the uh, jury pool and uh, how that also affects the movie. Um, and it's just, I don't know how to describe it. You just need to go watch it. It's a really good movie. And uh, its it'll keep you on the edge of your seat the whole time. Like, you'll laugh. You'll kind of be like, oh, dang, that's sad. And a lot of emotions. So, yeah, I definitely recommend it. It's a good movie. What uh, what genre would you consider it? Is it like full-on, like, crime, courtroom, drama kind of thing? Or is it like a mashup of a few different things? It, it's a mashup, but definitely it's, it's a courtroom movie. Um, it's also drama and actually even a little bit of comedy because um, there's some parts where you're just like kind of laughing. But um, yeah, that's why I love when you can't put a, a movie in a certain genre. It's just like all over the place. And that's why I think it makes a really good movie. So yeah, there you have it. Nice. All right. What do you call Mobley? All right. So my movie um, is called Mandy. Um, it's a, a horror movie. I would say it's sort of like psychedelic horror. It's um, very interesting and kind of a new sort of genre. Um, the, the movie came out in 2018 and directed by a director named Panos uh, Kozomatos. And I know I didn't pronounce that perfectly. Um, it stars Nicolas Cage. Oh. And I know, I know that a lot of people think that Nicolas hey, Cage yeah, is a horrible actor. But let me tell you something. Nicolas Cage is a fantastic B-movie actor. And this movie is like perfect for him. Like the role was made for him because what happens in this movie is like, it's sort of just like, like, I don't know, you would say average life for some people who live sort of out in the woods and they're just sort of living their life together um, for the first little bit of the movie. And then something really crazy happens and there's this cult that comes through their area and really messes with things. And like, I'm not really going to give you any spoilers. Um, or maybe I'll give you like a slight spoiler. Mandy dies, and it's because of the cult. And, what? And it makes Nicolas Cage's character so angry oh. that the rest of the movie is like this psychedelic revenge series of just like he goes and like he goes on this rampage, and it's like, like you you would think that you'd get bored of watching him kill people after like forty five minutes of the same thing, but no, they just keep it interesting. I just. I think you need to watch it. It's a, it's like there's a lot that you can't put into words, but it's visually very, very satisfying. Um, like the cinematography, the colors in the movie, the way that they use lighting, it's all super visually interesting. And a lot of the story is told through images rather than, you know, like dialogue. Um, so overall, I would say it's, it's very like artistic, um, but also sort of just like, genre bending like you said Lane. like you mm -hmm. mentioned that that honestly and that sounds just like a nicholas cage's powerhouse it's just we said cult psychedelic and just mind i was like yeah that's uh that's pretty much him right there in a nutshell right yeah, yeah so he's putting out some great stuff lately the first thing i was thinking is like if he's going on this rampage rampage you could almost say that he was uncaged <laughs> <laughs> you Stop. could yeah you could say nicholas cage is uncaged in this film yeah, they should have just called the movie Uncaged. <laughs> well, then he wouldn't have been in Andy it. Andy dies. There'd be no cage. That's true. Yeah, they need Nicolas Cage in the movie, so. Right. <laughs> or maybe he dies, like, in the first five seconds. It's like, oh, oh. what? <laughs> he was wearing a wig, and he actually was, uh, was it Mandy? Yeah. He was Mandy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they're <laughs> he turned around <laughs> the wig, and they're like, whoa, plot twist. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> Now that would have been good. That's wild. I think I've heard of that movie. Um, I never. I never, actually, I never heard of it. What? Uh, where can you watch it? Where can you watch it? Um, like yeah. at your house, I know, but like at my house, yeah, you have to go to my house to watch it. Exclusive okay, well, <laughs> at Mommy's house. 
He made it's it. the only copy of the movie on Earth, and Mobley has it. If you want to, if you want to watch the movie, I'll email it to you. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Just record the whole thing on your iPhone. Yeah. And say shot on iPhone at the end of it, and then send it to me. <laughs> I really, should, should, I, should I Google Apple. it and let you know? Is that a thing um, that we should say? Yeah, sure. All right, let me see if it's available on Netflix or what. As I'm sure one of the big apps will have it, like Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or HBO yeah. or we got. I'm gonna keep naming them all. Oh yeah, I think it's on Netflix. Oh okay. Well, oh, Netflix. Okay. Yeah, it's on Thank Netflix. You. Yeah, yeah. Usually when I'm trying to find a movie, I just kind of go down the list. Like, is it here? Nope. Is it here? Nope. Is it here? Maybe. You know, and it's got to go all the way down until I have to purchase it on my like, Amazon or or iTunes, which I don't mind because they they have pretty low rental prices. Uh, I don't mind paying that, but it's not a bad deal. It's quite. All right. Um, so for my movie, um, this one was an interesting movie for sure. Uh, it's called Tenant by Christopher Nolan. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. And um, uh, Mobley, have you seen it? I haven't seen it. Okay, so Lane, you, you saw it, but you only maybe saw half of it. Yeah, yeah, probably. It's the. I'll just say it's the worst movie to fall asleep to. Um, yeah, so fell asleep about during the middle part of it, which was probably the most crucial part to watch. Yeah, I will say though, I woke up during the last like thirty, forty-five minutes, and oh my gosh, I was like, I don't know what's happening, but this is crazy. So, so for those who have not seen it, Tenant uh, is a movie that came out this year in the theater, uh, which I highly recommend if you have not seen it to go see it in a theater if your local theater is open right now. Check it out. It is a, a, an amazing experience. It's, it's you know, Christopher Nolan's bread and butter. Um, loud noises, muddled dialogue, and incredible, like, layered <laughs> plot. It, it is everything that I love about Christopher Nolan films. And I would say uh, I got to see it twice in the theater, um, right before the theater started to close. Um, you, you almost have to see it twice. Um, but that was probably the, the coolest thing was seeing it in a theater. But I know it is coming out on VOD um, at home uh, to, to watch pretty soon. So if you don't feel comfortable going to a movie theater right now or your theater is no longer showing it, you can catch it uh, on streaming uh, pretty soon. But anyway, um, so Tenet is, is a large movie, very large movie, um, directed by Chris Nolan. Um, some of the people in it, You've got uh, John David Washington, who's the, the lead character, um, who happens to be, if you didn't know this, Denzel Washington's son. So you've got this next generation of, of Washingtons coming into the acting world. So uh, he's great in this film. Um, you really don't learn much about this character. Um, he doesn't even have a name. Um, and they just kind of like say, here's the lead guy, and you go with it. Um, but basically, just to kind of sum it up, it's like um, – uh, the synopsis is the, a secret agent embarks on a dangerous time bending mission to prevent the start of world war three. So it, it's, it's like if you took a James Bond movie and then mashed it up with like back to the future and inception, it's, it's a really, really awesome movie to watch. Um, it, it's one of those things that definitely like all his films makes you think, um, but it's one of those things where you have to multiple experiences with it. Um, And coming out of the theater, just, I I just felt this high of like, wow, that was awesome. I don't know completely what I just saw, but I knew it was awesome. Um, Some of the other people in the movie uh, forgot to mention Robert Pattinson, Michael Caine. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he played Guild War Lockhart in the Harry Potter films. He's actually the bad guy in this movie. So it's kind of all goofy and weird in Harry Potter. And then seeing, uh, as this like really menacing, um, Russian bad guy. But, um, yeah, it really kind of follows themes of James Bond, uh, with the secret agent approach and, um, throws in a lot of like wild sci-fi, uh, kind of plot devices that you just kind of, kind of, and as they say in the movie, don't try to understand it, just feel it. Um, where they explain a lot of these things and you're, you're either like in it or you're like, mm, I don't know, but I'll see what happens. But basically you just kind of, you just kind of push through the movie. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a 10 out of 10. Um, definitely one of my favorite, 
um, Christopher Nolan films. Uh, I, I could I could watch it over and over and over and find something new every time. Uh, there's a lot of places where you can get lost, uh, especially if you do fall asleep. But um, <laughs> if if you do get lost, a lot of different entry points back into the movie. You're like, okay, now I know what's happening. You know, so they they kind of give you opportunities to like fall in and out if you if you happen to not keep up. But um, but like Lane said, the the final act um, is is something that I've never seen before. Uh, and the way that they, they show time travel in the movie is really awesome. Um, they play with the idea of inverted time, where people are moving forward in time and also backwards in time. Uh, and the idea that the people moving forward are, you know, going at a normal rate, and then you're going backwards at the same rate. Um, it's, it's wild to explain. I'm not even going to try to get into it, because I don't want to give any information on the movie other than, like, what it is. Um, but yeah, highly recommend you see this in the theater. If not, check it out as soon as possible so you don't get it spoiled. Um, it's a great movie. Um, so yeah, Tenet by Christopher Nolan. What do you guys think? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Mob, I know you haven't seen it. You need to see it for sure. But uh, the way the last scene was shot was so intense. I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, I really have no clue what's happening, but uh, like this is good. Like the picture on it was insane. Well, the technological um, advances that, that are in this film, like I'm sure they used a lot of visual effects and a lot of practical effects. So you can't really see where, where it begins and ends. That's the crazy part. Like you, you don't ever know what's trickery and what is real. And so that kind of just like another layer on top of it. It's like, wait, was that real? Or was that like camera tricks and, and visual effects? So it's so, it's so wild. I mean, it's like, it's obviously different than Inception, which is literally all just like, wah, you know, these, these giant, <laughs> like, obviously that's not real. But like in this, it's like, it kind of like plays with your mind a little bit and makes you think that things are real and they may not be and vice versa. Right? Yeah. It like blends in with reality and not reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mobley, you should, you should definitely check this out if you can in a theater or at home. Cause I, I think you'll really enjoy it after the third time. <laughs> yeah. after the third time yeah. yeah i love movies like that that definitely uh sounds very interesting yeah it, it definitely has like uh like space odyssey vibes to it mm -hmm. uh, maybe not as out there as, as space odyssey but um but definitely that high level thinking and high concept um story and plot and everything but then they but then they give you enough information where you can can, can kind of follow the movie for what it is. Like, I wouldn't say, I mean, I know a lot of people might've walked out confused, but I would say um, the more you watch it, the more you understand, the more you'll, you'll love it. So. Yep. There you go. We'll check out. Dan. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to the TV segment of this topic. And um, Lane's going to start us off with his TV show that he would recommend to us. Yes, I will. Um, the name of my show is called The Unicorn, and although it sounds like a kid's show, it is not. <laughs> it's actually, so The Unicorn, it's, you can watch it on Netflix, by the way, there's one season out right now, which we flew through. It's like just little bite-sized episodes, like 20 to 25 minutes. Um, it's like a feel-good comedy, but like, I can compare it to like Modern Family or like The Goldbergs which I don't watch, but I know they exist. It's one of those shows where it shows after the Super Bowl or some big event on TV. It's on ABC or NBC. It's just like, just so happens to be on the TV. So you're like, well, I guess I don't really know what else to watch. I guess I'll just sit here and watch it. <laughs> and, but I got to say, though, like, th this is actually, it's a really good show. Um, I'm kind of biased, too, because uh, the main actor's name is uh, Walton Goggins. Um, he plays in these HB shows, on HBO shows, uh, Vice Principals and The Righteous Gemstones. If you haven't seen those, those are hilarious comedies. And it's funny because in those, he's kind of like, not really the bad guy, but he's just kind of misunderstood and just like set in his ways. And you can kind of see where he's coming from. And it's funny to see him go from that role to in The Unicorn. He's basically this uh, guy that, uh, he's a widow. His uh, wife passed away. Um, and he has two daughters that he's trying to raise. And he's got like a close knit group of uh friends that are helping him out along the way to get him back in dating. And that's hence the name unicorn, which I never knew this was a term, but basically it's like, he's too good to be true. Like 
that's what everyone, every woman looks for is like a really nice guy that is widowed and has, you know, two young daughters that he's raised by himself really well. And so that's basically why he's the unicorn. <laughs> and I was like, I never even knew that existed. But then again, unicorns, I guess, don't exist. So it's, it's a crazy concept. <laughs> but uh, it's just funny to see him play that guy role because he was not in that his, his past uh, acting or roles. But, but it's still funny because he is actually a really good guy in real life. Um, so it's just funny to see him be so diverse in his roles. And uh, it actually has some really funny moments in it where you're like, wow, I'm, I'm like, I know it should be like a cheesy show, but it's actually really funny and like pretty wholesome. So yeah, definitely check it out. It's, it's like I said, it's easy to watch short at, you know, episode you get down with one, you're like, oh, that was it. That was quick. <laughs> just fly through it. So yeah, I hope they keep, I keep, I hope they keep going on because they like vice principals are done with they only shot, I think two or three seasons and that was it. Uh, Righteous Gemstones, I don't know how much more they're they're signed up to do, but they only have, I think, one or two seasons out as well. So, yeah, I definitely recommend it. What would you kind of compare the show to? Uh, like I said, it, it's, it's literally one of those shows like Modern Family or uh, The Goldbergs, if y'all seen that. Um, th- those are the two that come to mind. Just the way it's shot and the way it's set up is just so, like, you know, every character has their set, like, who they are and you, you know someone in real life that's exactly like that person or, or know of someone it's like just this stereotype um so yeah i'd, I'd have to compare it to those two shows even though like i don't really watch them it's it's just it's really good like i said it's a feel good like family comedy but it's it's like i'd say it's like top tier for sure it feels like there's so many of those out there right now um i like i almost feel like i see an, another like sitcom show or another like family comedy you know, on streaming almost every day. It's so weird. It's kind of like a, a rebirth or, you know, kind of a, a new age of, of these shows because that was so popular 20, 30 years ago. You know, almost every TV show was one of those, but now it's seeing like a resurgence of that through streaming uh, is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the old school stuff, like even like kind of like Roseanne, like I'd say it's kind of almost like that. Well, that, that was like that era, but like now it's like kind of revamped in a way that it's, it's a lot I don't know. It's different. It's just in the set in a different time period. It's like kind of the same, same concept, same elements. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And you said that was yeah. on Netflix? Yeah, it's on Netflix. Uh, just season one's out right now. So, yep, go watch it. <laughs> All right, Mobley, what do you got for us? All right, so uh, my TV show that I'm going to talk about is Twin Peaks. And Twin Peaks is not a new show. It's, um, it's, been out around since the 90s and um, it's got kind of an interesting story um, an interesting timeline um, in reality as a show uh, rel- instead of the story's timeline let me talk about the show's timeline a little bit uh, so Twin Peaks um, it came out in the 90s and it was released and it had two seasons on I think two different networks um, and a movie that were all released in like the 90s or maybe early 2000s a little bit and it didn't um, get a whole lot of traction um, it was before Netflix, before any of the streaming stuff, and before people were really into cult um, followings of like TV shows and stuff like that. I guess people were, I mean, the people existed who would have followed it, but they weren't, they didn't talk as much because the internet wasn't around and forums weren't around and stuff like that. Uh, but Twin Peaks, um, it had a cult following back then. And then um, recently in, I think, maybe 2017 or something like that, um, they released a third season uh, that was strategically paced out like 15 or 20 years after they released the last thing um, so that things could have happened in that amount of time um, that all played into the story in season three. And what, I, what the reason I'm saying all this stuff is like season one and season two in the movie are all kind of dry and kind of boring relative to season three. But if you can get through those prequel type things and then watch season three, it is mind blowingly good. It is like, it's really good. It's like Game of Thrones good almost, I would say. So wow. uh, let me start to, start to explain what this show is about relative to, um, I mean, as opposed to just all the other stuff that I just talked about. Uh, so Twin Peaks follows um, the murder of Laura Palmer at the beginning. Um, she's a girl who was mysteriously murdered in a town called Twin Peaks. And um, it's, this murder is being investigated by the FBI. 
Uh, so FBI sends um, an agent, his name is Del Cooper. He's played by Kyle McLaughlin. Um, and if you've seen uh, Portlandia, he's the mayor in Portlandia. That's the actor. Um, so uh, Agent Del Cooper is a very methodical and very um, precise and logical type of person who um, has been sent to analyze this very mysterious and very sort of um, almost not logical murder in this very, very eerie place that almost seems supernatural. So it's sort sort of like the X-Files type of vibe where they're like, is it aliens? Is it uh, interdimensional time travel? What's going on with this stuff? Because there are things that logically could not happen in the show that he's trying to explain. Um, so season one and season two, they sort of try to take you through his, his uh, thinking and his uh, problem solving strategy. And um, it can be interesting at times, but like I said, it's also sort of dry and slow paced. And especially if you remember what TV was like in the 90s, it was a little bit slower than it is today. Um, so you, that's a little bit hard to bear through. Um, but season three, um, I'll, I'll give season three a little bit more time um, and I'll sort of like talk a bit more about what happens in season three. Um, so in, th in season three, um, a lot of stuff happens in Las Vegas. Um, the main character loses his memory and he lives a different life um, as a different person for like half of the season. And uh, it's one of the most frustrating things I've ever watched is to watch the main character of the show that you've been watching for so long, completely forget everything that happened in the past. But it did happen, but he's just like lost his memory. And so he's living like, you're just like watching a different show almost. It's like, oh, okay, he has got a different name and he's a different person. But then he remembers whenever he sticks a fork in an electrical outlet. So, <laughs> um, I mean, Bye. crazy Bye. stuff like that's happening all over the place. Like he goes into space into this tea kettle type, type thing. David Bowie's there. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Just watch Twin Peaks. That's all I have to say. What a pitch. You just started off with David Bowie and been like, oh, done, I'm going to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the build-up. It was like all of this, and then all of a sudden, David Bowie appears. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> Whoa. I'd be like, dang. So with Twin Peaks, it's, it has been um, going on for many, many decades, right? Like when, when did it first premiere, then when was the last season? So they, they had um, stuff. It started off in the 90s. and um, Basically, at the end of their release in, the, in that time, that initial release, the main character goes to another place, sort of like another world, and he's going to be trapped there for 25 years. And literally, they didn't release anything having to do with the franchise for 25 years until season three came out, whenever he gets out of that other world. Wow. So, like, it was just like the long game that they played. And it was so worth it because they had all that time to work with it, all that time to think of ideas and make it really good. So that's commitment right there. Like yeah, to, really, to really sit down and plan out, okay, well, we're going to do these seasons now. And then 25 years later, we're going to do these seasons. If we can get everybody right. together and actually get it done. And it's like, that's, that's rewarding right there. Especially yeah. for the fans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dang. That's pretty wild. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think any show's ever done that besides like bringing a show back. Um, mm -hmm. This is literally them picking up where it first left or where it left off. Right. Yep. And also, what's crazy is if you just watch it in in sequential order, just the way that the production has changed. It's a big. It's a big jump. It goes from being like '90s television camera looking type stuff to uh, full HD like really good colors, vibrant colors that, you know, like a typical Netflix show looks like. Um, but it's not like the stuff, it's, it's like they, they tie in a lot of the older stylistic stuff very tastefully. So hmm. it's not an ab abrupt, almost like, oh, this is a different show now, but it's also not like really cheesy like it was in the 90s, you know? So it's, it was kind of a challenge, I, I would have thought, to integrate that older style into something that would, that would work in modern day time, but they do it well. Mm -hmm. huh. You know, it'd been even funnier if they got technology that was even worse than the '90s. <laughs> but like, they're going even further backwards as they go forward, and it's like, yeah. oh wow, this is this got even cheesier and even worse. <laughs> they start using. And like, then they had the great value, David Bowie. That's 
or when he died, you know, they have him like weekend at Bernie's or carrying him around with sunglasses oh, on. Yeah. Like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been a good. I would watch that. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that that's a really cool, um, cool thought for a show and how they've been able to keep it up for this long. Do you know if they're going to make any more seasons? Have there been any talks about it? So, it's it's sort of like we we don't know. The creator, <laughs> his name is David Lynch. And people always ask him, it's like, are you going to make another season of Twin Peaks? Um, he's like, what's that? And he's, he's sort of ambiguous about it. He's, he won't say yes or no. And I don't know if he even knows if, if he can or not or if he will. Um, there ha he has sort of mentioned, it's like, I have some ideas uh, on the horizon, but I don't know if they're actually going to come to fruition or not. So it remains to be seen, maybe. That's interesting. I've always, you know, I've heard of Twin Peaks, and I, I just never knew all the mystery and, like, everything surrounding it, but that, that makes sense now that they were kind of, I mean, to have two different seasons on two different networks, and then to wait so long, and then to start again, I'm like, no wonder it just was kind of, there's no contingency, it was, like, very, yeah, split up. So, and one thing that I would add to that also is that season three, if they, that's the last thing that they ever release, it would be complete. Like, there's, there's no cliffhangers, or, I mean, there's nothing really, like, that you're like, I don't, I need to know what happened to this person or what, what was going on with this instead. You know, it, it leaves, it ties up a lot of the loose ends. And if they wanted to end it up through at season three, I think that it would be complete. Okay. Yeah. Cause so I was going to ask you um, if they had left it kind of open ended for more seasons, but I mean, it is open enough, but it's, it's also close enough that they could leave it. That's, that was smart then on their part. Mm -hmm. So wait, how many seasons are out? Three. Three. Yeah. Oh, just three. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they might just, he might just leave it like that or wait another 25 years. He's like, ah, here we go. Yeah. Now we're, now we're ready. <laughs> but they can always do something cool with it. Like if as you mentioned in the beginning of season three, that he's like basically mind wiped. Right. If he wanted to do some kind of spinoff series or something based on that universe. They could totally do that. And like, it'd be like a spinoff kind of thing. Maybe new characters and maybe bring in some of the older characters as like references or they could go completely like just brand new and start uh, within the universe and to tell a different story, you know, as a continuation. There's, there's a lot of things they could still do, honestly. Oh yeah. Yeah. They could, yeah, they, 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 could, do, they could do it kind of like how American horror story does it, where every season is a new story and a new, like a new case or something like that'd be kind of a cool concept. Mm -hmm. in that way, if you, miss the seasons like i doesn't really matter i can just go to the next one and keep going yeah like kind of like black mirror it's an anthology oh, every, every yeah day. black mirror yeah. i really like, uh, i wish stranger things was an anthology that would have been cool rather than them trying to like tell that those kids story for four seasons i feel like it would have been cool if like each season was its own like stranger things kind of thing oh we have a visitor oh. speaking of stranger Hello, things <laughs> <laughs> wow what a kibbles cute. he's a kid kibbles. nice do you have another cat named bits yeah no, <laughs> no dang it <laughs> all right well um from here we'll move on to music uh, i know that's some of our favorite topics so um lane you're gonna kick this one off um with your selection of music to talk about Perfect. Um, so yeah, so mine's David Bowie. No, I'm just kidding. Whoa. <laughs> How ironic Ooh, that yeah. it all tied together. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no. Um, so mine's actually the new uh, Bring Me the Horizon album called Post Human Survival Horror. Mm. Um, yeah, which is pretty much the nickname for 2020. Um, so it's fitting. That's the theme of the um, album. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's going to be the sequel. <laughs> Yeah, post human twenty twenty. Um, no, but uh, this album was really like. I mean, I know you've listened to it every time. I don't know if Matthew listened to it. I know you kind of gotten off of hardcore music, but um, it, it's really good because they like it's so diverse. Like, I mean, if you listen to the first album compared to the last or first song compared to the last song on the album, they're like nothing alike. Yeah. Um, but in a good way. Like, it's uh, 
the first one to me kind of made me uh, think about back to their old, like old Bring Me the Rising days. Um, it was very rattle the gates, it was very heavy. Um, just the, the rhythm of it was very like in your face. And there's even like a guitar solo, which I was like, well, that's crazy. <laughs> I just threw it in there and I was like, this is very metal. Um, and then of course you have Obey, which was, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, was that the only single off the album or, or no, that and Parasite Eve, right? Those yeah, I think there was three singles. Um, oh, three the, singles. What, what, what was the third one? Teardrop. I know. Oh, that's right. That's right. But uh, Obey was probably my favorite one because I also had, I like that they also brought in, I love when, like I'm a sucker for when artists bring in other artists to like feature on their stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Youngblood, which actually I've, I've heard of him. He's, very different um like his <laughs> other, his other song i mean it's which is weird to hear him in obey i was like oh this is like kind of not his really normal route that he goes but it was really good obviously um of course he had a uh, kingslayer with baby metal um that one was interesting to bring in like that japanese it's like dance metal and i'm like what yeah. the heck is this <laughs> but i was like i love this so i was like, this like is dance so... dance evolution music or something yeah it's like dance dance evolution <laughs> metal yeah, i'm like what <laughs> but i loved it i was like what the heck i like, grew on me though like the first listen i was like mm-hmm. i don't know about all this nonsense so i was like okay no i like this, this is good <laughs> um and then what else yeah, the final song with uh, Amy Lee, which I don't know who that is, but I guess she's in the song. Um, it's very, it's very soft and melodic, which is uh, funny because it's like nothing like the rest of the album. That's the one song I'd say sticks out the most. Um, but I mean, it was, it was obviously really good. Um, wouldn't say it's my favorite. I, I'd have to say my favorite out of all of them was probably uh, either Obey, Dear Diary, or Kingslayer. Those are like my, my top three. Um, yeah, and of course, what was it? The other one was uh, One by One with the Nova Twins, which I, again, I don't know who they are, but like I said, it, it, jazz, it spiced up the album. But yeah, overall, I'd give it, I wouldn't say it's their best album, or my, me personally, for me, my favorite album, but I would say it's definitely their most diverse and most like, it, it gives a good overview of what Bring Me the Horizon is as far as like their, their overall sound. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd definitely give it like an eight and a half, eight and a half or nine. Before I give so, my, I want to I get Mobley's reaction first. Like, what are, what are your thoughts for if you if you haven't heard it? Like, what is your kind of overall reaction to the band and then possibly even this album? Like, I'm I'm curious of your take on this band because because they've they've changed so much since we you know maybe heard them back in like high school. And um, when they were like huge, like deathcore band that nobody had ever heard of, to now that they're like this top forty um, rock band, you know, that was on a now a now CD a couple of years ago. Like it's just so weird, you know. Even seeing their posters in Walmart one one day was weird. I was like, never did I ever think that this would happen. But but I'm very curious, Molly. What what is your reactions and thoughts here? Well, I think. Um... You know, maybe they, what they were doing was they were just seeking the path that takes them the furthest, you know? And so like they're, they're trying to find what people want and maybe they're really good at it. Maybe they have a lot of ears out there that are listening to what people are saying about, you know, like what if they tried this sound or what if they tried that sound? And it's pointing them all towards like something that's new and something that people are, are, are liking. Um, but I don't really have very much to say as far as like uh, the specifics of their sound and the specifics of how they've changed, because honestly, I haven't listened to them. Um, so I can't really make much comment there. Okay. Well, perfect. Well, I'm about to sell it to you because <laughs> you got to check this album out. Like regardless of what yeah. music um, anybody like who's listening, like regardless of what kind of list music you like, if you're a fan of music, I highly recommend this album to you. Um, this this was really cool for them to put out this year because we weren't getting a lot of new music to begin with. A lot of people were having to take breaks, um, especially from touring, getting canceled and things like that. I thought um, the coolest thing about this album is that, like I kind of mentioned earlier, the evolution that this band has come through. So back in like 2006, 2007, um, they kind of started off into the, the underground, you know, uh, rock scene as like, this deathcore band, um, you know, played a lot of warp tours, did a lot of festivals and things like that and kind of gained their 
um, their name through that. And then it wasn't until maybe, I think it was 2013, when uh, That's the Spirit uh, came out. After they, they kind of took a break for a few years after they dropped uh, Sip Internal, um, which came out maybe 2010-ish, maybe, something like that. Uh, I just remember, like, there's, like, this um, – the 2000s music and then like the 2010s music like there's there's two different bands that we're we're experiencing here you have all the deathcore and hardcore stuff and then it wasn't until 2013 where they kind of came back and reinvented themselves um with the, the album that's the spirit which happened to hit um the top 40 on the on the radio charts it was playing everywhere on rock radio pop radio there was just some kind of appeal to it that all these new fans were finding them um, as, lo- as well as the old fans. And, and like I mentioned, they got on a now CD. Like that was the, the funniest thing. Like you've got like all these other like pop artists and then bring me to the horizon, you know? <laughs> so that was, that was a, a wild thing back then uh, with the more kind of radio friendly rock sound, similar to like early Linkin Park and things like that. And then the last, the album after that, which came out a couple of years ago uh, called Amo or Ammo, whichever way you want to say it, that kind of evolved their sound even more to where they brought in more pop influence, which a lot of people didn't like. Um, but for someone like me who kind of had not listened to the band for a while um, after the two thousands, like kind of got me in a, in a place where like, this is really interesting and innovative for not only pop music, because typically pop music right now is just a lot of the same stuff kind of just done different ways but what they were able to do is take those things that people are doing and integrate it into this radio rock kind of sound that um that's just kind of pushes that genre forward because rock music has kind of been in a weird spot right now where it's not as innovative as as some genres like hip-hop and and edm and things like that so that that was kind of the album that was a turning point for them for me uh which you should definitely check that one out too that kind of sets this one up um so that was just a little brief history on the band but like this album is kind of taking a little bit of of some of that stuff you heard in 2000s and bringing it into the pop mainstream which is really funny because like a lot of new people i think uh, it was a few years ago me and lane went to a show that they headlined um at the the ballroom in dallas and uh, i think they played with bear tooth and under oath which was a great show um, but what was nuts is the amount of people that were there to see Bring Me to the Horizon that probably had never like been to a show in that music scene before um, that had found them out through some of those, those radio songs that they had out uh, with their first album or their first, you know, top 40 album. So it was amazing to see that many people there to see them because like I said before, they weren't hugely popular in the mainstream. And the the wild thing was, um, hearing them take those those pop things, those pop sounds, and integrating it into the rock music, along with the old deathcore kind of tropes and styles that you would have heard in their like first few albums, and making that a mashup uh, in a really interesting way where you don't get more one thing over the other. Um, I would say, like he was saying, uh, I would agree that it's very diverse. You get a lot of different sounds. Some songs are a lot heavier and kind of feel like that old sound. Like he even brings back some of those, those growls and screams that he used to do back in the day. And like, I could just imagine, you know, some top 40 pop person listening to that and like, yeah, I like bring me the rise. And then they hear this and they're like, what's going on? You know, they're like freaking out. I'm scared. That's yeah. I'm scared. But but like, that's the band and what made them, you know, um, that kind of got them started in the beginning and them reintegrating that into this new music. Um, to all these fans that have never heard that style before or don't typically listen to it has kind of opened their minds uh, as well as pushed the genre forward. So that's that's kind of my biggest takeaway from this album. The last album was kind of toying with that idea. The one before that was pretty much strictly rock, but it happened to one song blow up, you know, to get them where they are now. But, but this album's kind of like a stake in the ground saying, this is who we are. We're a little bit of the old, but we're also pushing our – are being forward and trying to expand the idea of rock music and pop music uh, in, in this current decade. So it's, it's really, really something interesting. The production is like top notch. 
like better than any of their past albums, in my opinion. Um, I wouldn't say that this is initially my favorite yet, but it's definitely growing on me. It kind of, it plays like a, it play, it's only got nine songs, but it plays, it, 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 and you could call it an album, but it plays like an EP. Uh, it feels very short, quick. A lot of the songs are kind of sporadic and, and like you said, diverse. So it's definitely something to break into and kind of get a feel of the band. Like I would show this to somebody um, new to the band or somebody that's kind of interested in, in what their sound is, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. But yeah, all that. sampler plate, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, if you haven't heard the album or you haven't heard the band, definitely check this album out to kind of get the, the idea of what you're, what you're listening to. Um, or just kind of like a little bit of the old and new. Yeah, yeah cool. for sure. Yeah, they surprised me with this album because Amo just came out and I was like, oh, I was yeah. not thinking they're sitting on material. So it was, it was really wild that they put this out. Well, yeah, it was but, cool how they came out too. They started with like studio videos, maybe back in like February or March, right before mm -hmm. shutdown, uh, and kind of documented the whole process for the fans. I thought I'd never really seen that happen I, I mean i don't think it was in exact real time but like there's probably like a delay of like a few weeks in between each video of showing the next part of the process and so they almost like by the time they had finished all the videos they had a first single out and and that yeah. was um that was really cool because like you saw the process they're like we don't care about spoiling the album we want to show you how we're having to kind of work in the shutdown remotely and um and during quarantine and so that was really interesting way to introduce the album it wasn't a big build up or anything it's just like hey we're making music for you right now here's how we're doing it and then we're gonna have a single for you and then eventually by the end of the year have a full album which was really cool to see that process kind of like because typically it doesn't it doesn't take uh it takes a little bit longer than that but they kind of just dove in and, and got it done got after it yeah so literally yeah. march to September uh, or on mm -hmm. dropped, which is which is crazy to think that you would put out three singles, promote, and put out an album and shoot two to three music videos for each. Yeah, that, That's that is a really short time frame. I'm like, what the heck? Yeah, because the, the first single they put out, they had to film the music video after they dropped the single and um, and put the music video out. I think pretty pretty close to the same time. So they they like had the single and then the video was ready to go um, about the same time. And then, um, and then they had to go back and, and film the other two videos at some point as they put out the other songs. So like all throughout the summer, they were promoting this, this, uh, this album essentially that they eventually announced in the fall. So they, they had been hustling <laughs> when they could have easily just taken a break, you know? And yeah, and, I mean, well, then again, like you said, the album's short. And also, when you bring in other artists, like three or four, I mean, that helps speed the process up, too, because they have their input and, like, so many more ideas can, like, come to life. So, I mean, that's the half the album got written right there, just right off the bat. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, they worked with a really good producer. Uh, I forget his name. Uh, Mobley, I'll have to send it to you, but... Um, I think it's Matthew Mobley. No, that he... Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Yeah, you remember now. <laughs> yeah, so what was it like working on this album? <laughs> he just hustled us he's like yeah i haven't heard of him in so long um who again what is that <laughs> but the, the producer that they got was really good and they got a couple of videos on youtube kind of showing that process yeah uh, and it really kind of uh gives you an idea of what the album was kind of go where it was kind of going i remember with the first single i was like this is wild i was like i love this it's it's that you know kind of familiar friendly radio rock style very catchy stuff uh which a lot of people that are fans of them maybe like or don't like but um there was a, a good mix of everything yeah absolutely well, i don't think i can sell it to you anymore for anyone listening but um just really yeah. really cool really cool stuff absolutely yep that's it all right Mobley, what you got <laughs> all right so my album that i'm going to talk about today um it's called cola like Coca-Cola, but just Cola with a C. Um, and the artist is A Beacon School. Um, so Cola is the first full-length album released uh, by A Beacon School. Uh, a Beacon School had um, 
they had an EP on Bandcamp that they released prior to this. Oh, wow. Um, but Cola is their first full album release. Um, they are, I believe, it's either just a guy. Um, his name is Patrick J. Smith or something. Or maybe he has a band, but there's not very much information on the internet about them. Um, but whenever you Google it, it's just a picture of one guy. So I assume it's just him. Um, he's based out of New York City. Um, and uh, this album was released, um, I believe, last year, early last year. Um, it's a very, um, I would say, an innovative sound. Um, it's not that they're using different or unique or, or new instruments. Um, it's a very typical lineup of just drums and bass and guitar and stuff like that. Um, but I would say that the, the guitars, they have a very like large melodic sound. Um, so he's building like a soundscape with rhythm guitars and it's all, it's not so much chording as it is like arpeggiations and melodies that play in together um, and complement each other um, in very unique and beautiful ways. So um, some of my favorite songs off of this album, um, the first track on the album is called Algernon. And um, right, right off the top of the, the song, you'll hear exactly what I'm talking about with how the textures um, of the songs are built with the guitar. Um, and so like the way, I think that the way that he's building these songs up is he, um, he writes parts that are simple and then stacks many parts on top of one another. And so that the sum of those individual parts comes out to something more than the individuals would. Um, and it's really, a, I think it's a beautiful technique that works very well uh, for the style of music. Um, the, the lyrics also, um, the vocals in, in particular, um, are very like sort of ambient, um, reverby, um, relaxed and cushiony, I would say. Um, the whole vibe of the album is, um, I would say, oh, there's a lot of like, major key songs. It's not like a, a positive, poppy, sappy type of thing. It's just like a, a good like background type of neutral feeling. And um, the overall, I would say, um, very enjoyable too. Uh, so that's really, that's, um, that's my pitch for that album, I would say. Um, you should definitely check it out. If anything, um, the first song on the album is called Algernon, listen to that. And then the second to last song is called A Fade in Nylon. And that's my favorite off of the album. Nice. So would you say that they're kind of one specific genre or, or do you hear a little genre bending going on? I would say that um, it's not like they're they're trying to innovate as far as genres go. Like they're not trying to hybridize or blend two things together. It's sort of um, indie rock. It, it knows what it is. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's not super out there. I think that you would listen to it and be like, this feels comfortable to call um, a standard sort of ambient shoegazy type of sound. Okay, that is so mobbly. <laughs> That's just such a mobbly thing to say. Like, it knows what it is. Yeah, it, it knows what it is. Said it right. <laughs> they should put the quote what... on the back of the album. It, it knows what it is, Matthew Mark. <laughs> genre, <laughs> genre, it knows what it is. Yeah. <laughs> like, dang. You're fixing to know, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that actually, so it passes the vibe check. Um, I definitely want to listen to it, like, as background, like, so it's a good like background album you can just kind of chill to. That's oh yeah, I, I would say you know you could put it on if you're driving and you don't you want to zone out. It's great for that. Um, but also if you want to just like listen to it actively, it's I would say it's it's great. You know you you um, how about this? Listen to this album front to back, first song to last song on a car ride or when you're commuting to work or whatever, and that's the best way to listen to it for the first time. Yeah. Okay. I mean. For me, like when I hear anything new, I like to listen to it first, kind of in, more intently, um, whether it's with like speakers or headphones or something like that. And then what I'll do is a few days later, I'll pop it in the car and listen to it while I'm driving. Like you, you pick up different things when you listen to an album in different environments uh, in different situations. So like the difference between sitting and listening intently versus driving around and kind of just hearing it like you were saying in a background situation or if you're like folding clothes or doing whatever around the house like that uh it kind of gives you different layers and different experiences so that's that's really cool that 
that it's kind of made to be more background, but like you can, you can also listen to it intently and get a lot out of it. Right. It's almost like a, you know, like a pattern painting or like a wallpaper. Um, you know, like you would never think of wallpaper as something to really look at intently and closely, but um, I mean, there's art, there's, there's craftsmanship that goes into it. And I'm not calling, I'm not calling my album wallpaper because it's, it's more, but it's more interesting than wallpaper, but it's like an example, you know, like people sit down and they design wallpaper. And if you wanted to appreciate it like art, you could. Yeah. It's like right. things, you don't see it until you see it. Right. And seeing is half the battle, is I think what they say. <laughs> so. All right. Um, so we'll move over to, um, to my album, which is from the artist Paris. Um, if you're not familiar with Paris, they are fairly new. I think they got their start back in 2014, 2015. And um, I've kind of followed this band since they started. Um, first time I ever saw them was at Warp Tour, maybe in 2014 or 2015, around that time when they put out their first album. And so, like, I didn't really know who they were at the time. I maybe only knew a few songs. And um, it's a three or four piece band, uh, a female lead vocalist, and she does most of the writing. She sings and plays guitar. Um, but there's there's just such a, um, as Lane was kind of mentioning, vibe. There's such a vibe to uh, this band and the sound that they've created. Um, I would say, uh, to kind of describe their genre, it's, it's kind of like if you took a top 40 pop song and then you added, like, you know, actual instruments to it, not necessarily electronic production, and then um, just added a whole lot of atmosphere to it. So it kind of, kind of opening up um, the, the, the sonic feel a little bit uh, that's kind of what Paris is, and they've really evolved over the past few albums. I think they have like three or four out right now at this point, um, and they just released their, their latest album, which is called Use Me, and the difference between this album and their past two or three is this one was all written and recorded by Lynn Gunn, the vocalist. Um, like I said, she does a lot of the writing. Um, they kind of went a different direction with this album because um, she kind of felt like the band dynamic, um, that while it was working, that there was something different they could do with it. And she kind of took that and kind of ran with it herself. And I'm sure they all had a mutual agreement on it and kind of did their two cents where it made sense. But like, I feel like this album compared to the last few, you can really tell that, that there was this, this vision um, towards the, at the very beginning of like what this was going to be. And this album definitely plays with a lot of cool sounds, stuff I've never really heard before. Um, and they're really known for like their, their grooves, uh, whether that's the drum beat, the bass riffs, like they're just really fun to listen to. And then even better live. I saw them a few years later after Warped Tour at the House of Blues in Dallas. And they basically sold out the place. And it was like some of the loudest cheering I've ever heard loudest like singing from the audience and like just they had the whole place in the palm of their hands and I think that was like their first headlining tour ever I'd only seen them before kind of opening up or a, a warp tour so this was like getting this was them kind of flexing all of their uh, their muscles when it comes to their sound and their live show um, but definitely um, check out this new album check out some of their old albums a few highlights would have to be um, lead sing single, which actually, to kind of give a little bit of background, before this album came out, they had dropped a five or six song EP called Hallucinations, which was the lead single for this album. Um, so Hallucinations is a great song. It really like plays with this very bouncy groove beat and like just hangs on it and then just sprinkles all this nice texture with like harps and scents and, and then just slaps you across the face from the chorus. It's, it's just like a, per a perfect mix of, of just uh, a nice groove and a catchy chorus uh, and a giant, giant hook. Like once you hear that, you're going to be like, Oh my gosh. I'm, I think I remember the first time I heard it, I was in the office working, um, 
I think it came out at the beginning of this year, and I just couldn't stop listening to it. Like every time it stopped, I'd have it on repeat. It was just such a good um, song to li- listen to intently, like we were saying, but also a great song for like the background. It just like keeps you going. And like I was, you know, sitting there working, but Hallucinations, Death of Me, that's a great one. Another kind of bouncy uh, pop rock. But then there's a, a couple of other weird ones like Give Me a Minute and, um, and Dead Weight that are very kind of out there. Give Me a Minute is the first track. It was one of the singles. And as soon as you get into it, you're like, this is wild. It reminds me of like the White Stripes a little bit as far as like the simplicity of the guitar riff. But then, um, but then like the chorus itself, the, the melody is not, not necessarily super like catchy on purpose. It just kind of like follows the instrumental. So the, in this song, the instrumental is like, the melody or the the hook is more than the actual lyrics. So I thought that was kind of an interesting way to start the album. And then from there on, it kind of takes you on this dynamic ride of like upbeat, fun, um, kind of, you know, groovy songs to like more low key um, kind of slow ballads. And then kind of takes you, like I said, up and down. Um, Their style overall is kind of a little bit more on the darker, like, darker side not necessarily like bright and like happy um which kind of balances out like they have these like bubblegum pops kind of melodies and beats but then it's like got this shade of of a darker tone to it uh with the ambience like i mentioned earlier so um all kind of mixed together in this really interesting thing called paris so and that's paris with the p v r i s um for those who want to check that out but um this album for sure kind of tested um, and challenged the, the, the typical audience and fan, um, which I think is a good thing. I think artists should always evolve and continue to um, challenge the listener, present new ideas, new thoughts. Um, some people will probably be upset that it's a little bit more on the um, mainstream pop kind of sound, but I feel like it's a great evolution of where they've kind of started to where they are now. So after this, I'm really interested to see where this goes if this is kind of like, you know, staking their claim or this is a transition into something else. So, uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts and reactions on Paris? Use me. Uh, I mean, like, I, I honestly have only listened to a few of their singles. I'm not, I'm not listening to their albums top to bottom. Um, but, I mean, hearing it, it basically – I mean, you don't want to compare them to bands like Paramore that have, you know, female vocals, but yeah. naturally you kind of just do because right. they're kind of they're kind of the unicorns, quote unquote, uh, of the industry. So uh, you don't you don't see it very often, so it's very unique, and uh, so that gives them a lot of room to work with. You know, like they can kind of experiment a lot more, and I guess get away with it because like it's kind of uncharted territory. I, I feel like. Um, so like for them to be able to perfectly capture that that sound and that genre in that area is like a really big deal. Um, and I think also too they they're really I feel like they're really good about since they are a new band. Um, I think they cater really well to their target audience um, because like they knew right off the bat they're like we're gonna play for this crowd. And like <clears throat> instead of them like some bands like like are going back to Bring Me the Horizon. They started off kind of that way, but then they wanted to reach a bigger audience. Like Molly was saying is like they just wanted to break the mold. And but some bands are just totally fine with just perfecting one like type of sound or one type of uh, atmosphere in, in their music, and they just go after it. I think another great example of that is like Silverstein. Um, they they just like, I mean, they just like every album. It's different, but it's not like they're pretty much playing the same style, but in, they're just bringing it up in different ways. You know, it's like I guess I think that's the best way to put it. And I feel like Paris is in that same ballpark. They're just they perfected that that specific sound so well that they just can get away with kind of writing the same album, but not at the same time. Exactly. Like I said, I mean, it doesn't I seem like it makes that. sense, but yeah, I think that's that's really cool. And I I really like bands that are you know able to do that. So I think that's that's a really tough thing to do. For sure. The thing I was gonna say, um, another band that's a lot like that, Lane, like you're saying that they have a sound, and every single album is different but it sounds just like the band. Like you could say that album sounds like that band, you know, 
is for mm -hmm. me Interpol. Interpol is a band that oh, yeah. mm -hmm. consistently released albums and they always have very good and unique music on each album. And I would, but I would say that each album, it has a very distinctly Interpol sound. And you, right. can, you can rely on that almost. It's like they've sort of carved out their, ni their niche in what music is. Mm -hmm. So if that's what Paris has, like, like I said, uh, or like I haven't mentioned, but I'm not super familiar with Paris either. Um, but like what, if what you're saying is similar for them, um, I think that they they have a track to success and they're, they're already on it, you know, so. I would yeah. definitely say this is the first album that, like I said, challenged the, the perception of the band because their first album came out um, and just kind of took the world by the storm. Um, with the different um, types of pop rock, like basically like bands like like you mentioned Paramore, and then even like Flyleaf and some of those other female led rock bands, kind of laid the foundation for bands like Paris to kind of take that and be like, I'm going to do something different and experiment like crazy, and give you something different that you would have probably expected me to do something more like those bands, and created its own you know its own audience and its own sound from that. So definitely commend them for doing that, and then. You know, like it's like I said, the past couple albums kind of established that, and then this is the first one to kind of push it into new territory. Because like, there's a lot of like inspiring um, d melodies and different kinds of instrumentals. The sounds and production are just so interesting, and that's why I feel like it can feel, appeal to just about anybody um, because of because of that. Like I, I know I've shown it to people that maybe not necessarily familiar with that genre or that even that music scene and they're like well this is really interesting and cool you know you don't hear it every day um but i know from like a production standpoint there's a lot of things that you could probably take away from it mobley um that would be like whoa that's cool or i i think that's interesting how they did that you know just kind of different um different tricks and and things like that that kind of made this album in, in really special and interesting so that's kind of all i got on on this album but I highly recommend you check it, check them out. They're going to blow up. They're on their, their trajectory to do that. Um, especially now that they've kind of refocused the band to just being about her and kind of making her the, the face. I mean, she kind of was before, but it was always about the band, but now they're kind of honing in on, on who she is and she's kind of the personality and the sound. So I'm interested to see where that goes. Yeah. I think, well, no, just one more kind of note is like, I, I think a lot of people think the success of a band is how popular like one or few songs or an album can get. But I think it's equally impressive the longevity of a band. Like, if they have been around for forever and they're still relevant, it's like, wow, that's really impressive. So if they're on that pathway and they keep going and in the next 15, 20 years, like, oh, wow, they're still like going strong, that's, I think that's equally impressive as well. Yeah, there's definitely the element of the long game that you have to consider when you're playing in a band, um, whether that's, you know, evolving with the times, um, not necessarily just hopping on a bandwagon, but considering the time period that you're playing this music in and what makes sense the most for the band to do musically um, or, or anything like that, like that's something to consider if you want to have a long a longevity as a band um, and kind of how you weave in and out of that without, without going too trendy and being gone you know, here and gone after a week because it's no longer cool or it's no longer a thing anymore or it's overdone. Um, but <clears throat> using those elements as you go, that's, that when you go back and listen to their discography that you were like, okay, that sounds like it was done in this year. That sounds like it was done in this year. You know, and then that, that can be a good thing or a bad thing depending on the band. But there is something interesting about how bands kind of, evolve over time and have that longevity and how they're able to kind of reinvent themselves over time. I mean, there's, there's just countless bands that like our parents grew up to grew up listening to that are still playing today and still selling out arenas. And it's because they've figured out how that longevity longevity game works with, with what they're writing. Yeah. So wild to think that they can just keep going and keep getting more and more fans over time. Because it's not easy. Yeah. Definitely not easy. It's very easy to get stuck in a, uh, a specific box that the audience kind of paints you into. So um, 
we're going to jump over to our final jam. And this is where we're just going to hack it out and um, just have fun with it. So um, I'm going to say, uh, just to start out, um, and kind of on theme with today, just kind of came across my mind, um, with 2020 being the way it is, what do y'all think 2021 and beyond will be like? Uh, kind of following this experience or the continuation um, or just like the aftermath. That's just an interesting thought. And I wanted to kind of pose that question to you guys um, as we start to wrap up this episode. I think that uh, one thing that we've realized is that office space isn't as necessary as we thought, you know, um, a, a lot of people have no problem doing their job from home completely. And um, I've heard that some companies are looking at completely eliminating um, their standard cubicle office spaces and either working with like uh, office sharing companies or like space sharing companies or just having all their employees telecommute. And I think that that's, um, that's going to be a, a unique and new landscape that we're going to have to navigate when we get there, you know? Definitely. Like from, from me working in an office, for the past four years and to the all, and then all of a sudden not, it's very interesting to see how my company and many other companies have approached this, this issue because um, for, for me, like I work in a building that's 16 floors um, and at least 50 to 60 people on each floor. And, um, and the reason we haven't gone back is because there's so many people in our building and with all the guidelines and restrictions, like it would, just to get up to our floor in the elevator, like if everybody was like showed up at eight, it would take half a day to get everybody up to their floors. Cause there'd be like maybe two people per elevator. So it's like, it's this weird thing. And for somebody like me who got so used to working in an office and um, kind of benefits from working around an environment um, in the creative space, being able to bounce around ideas from people um, getting inspired by something somebody said in a meeting or um, or just just the environment of being around other creative people um, that definitely has taken a loss for me uh, just not being able to to experience that and then even the office culture um, you know it's 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 just a, an odd feeling um, you know after working from home to not have all of that to kind of back you up um, along with your your work process and workflow. So that's, that's what's kind of hit me the most. And I'm hoping that in 2021, um, which we've, you know, spoken on a, a, re, a phase back into the office plan after the new year, that hopefully we can start phasing back in um, and probably still be wearing masks well into spring. Um, but just to get everybody back together again, um, I think that that's going to be the biggest challenge especially for a lot of office buildings. And then the fact that you mentioned that a lot of companies are kind of reassessing their work from home and work in the office policy, that's going to affect a lot of companies and um, it may help them more, help them out financially. Um, and that might be the decision making behind it, or it could be the health reasons. But um, this event has definitely um allowed everybody to kind of take a step back and think about how we do things every day. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I feel like there definitely has to be a balance of things um, because I, I personally would prefer to do things in person just because I'm kind of more outgoing and it's hard for me to show emotions like through text or through like, you know, camera or whatever. Uh, it might, cause it might get miscommunicated. Whereas if I'm in person, it's very clear. It's like, Oh, you know, these are the social cues you pick up on, whereas like at home, it might get lost in translation. That That's the only thing that kind of hurts me. Um, but even like wearing masks, that also kind of can hurt you because in, like, it's like, well, people don't see like, you know, this compared to like, you just hear a voice talking and it's muffled now compared to like me smiling and like, I mean, also you get to see my beautiful mustache. So it's like, come on. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that that's the weird part for me, especially being for me, my industry is, you know, food. So it's like, you can't go home and serve people food from your house and be like, okay, um, I'll eat it for you, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, but I will say we actually, you know, with delivery coming that that's another thing that's evolved a lot. Um, 
to where now it's the point where you're like, yeah, just leave it on the doorstep and we don't have to talk or communicate. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, and technology in a way has impacted that big time to where it's just like, oh, we don't even have to talk to each other to get our food. It's just like, you know what to do, basically. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you didn't yeah. want to talk to me. That's fine. Yeah, all, but, all these new habits have formed. Yeah, uh, just stuff like that. People are even coming to do normal. Yeah, people are either change their habits once things get kind of back to a normal, uh, or they're gonna either continue to do what they've been doing. Like the, I feel like contactless deliveries, uh, Uber Eats, and all that kind of stuff. Like that's here to stay. I feel like that is all going to continue moving forward, uh, especially. Um, you know, if there's other kind of threats, you know, out there besides just COVID, um, this will be something that will kind of bring bring those uh, chances of something else um, happening down. Um, and people are just going to be used to it. I mean, I'm already used to, to the delivery. Uh, I rarely go out to get food unless I just really want to get out of the house and like do something, you know, semi-normal for the time being. But but it's just so wild to see how quickly everyone has accumulated these new, new habits, new routines, uh, and then new tools like, like, um, video, uh, zoom and, um, and other things like that, that have kind of allowed us to, to function in this, in this weird time. Yeah. I mean, and some people would argue it's a generational thing, but at the same time, like, I don't know, like seeing our generation grow up, a lot of people fear what's unfamiliar. So if it's easy and convenient for them, they're going to keep just doing how they've always done things. Um, Cause I, I believe it, I was like, oh, well, that's just the older generation. They, they don't know, but I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think at the same time, technology is advancing so quickly just for us that like a lot of our, our age group, they're still like, oh, I, I don't understand this. So I'm going to do what I know um, because you know, I don't want to change and I'm going to keep it that way. So at the same, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I don't know, is that going to be also, I think that's a big factor to consider because a lot of people aren't willing to learn the new technology or they just, like I said, want to keep doing what they've always done. It's like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. And they're having so, to adjust, you know, whether their life situation or their job has changed. Um, you know, they've had to, you know, form to a new lifestyle. A lot of people have, and um, yeah, it's interesting to see that shift because it's basically almost affected everybody um, at this point. And um, I don't know about you, Mobley, but um, how how was how was the this transition, or what are some of the new habits that you've noticed um, with yourself, but then even like your local community? Well, um, I would say in myself, I noticed that I I stopped going out for pretty much any reason that wasn't completely necessary. So like at the beginning of the lockdown, the only thing I left the house for was to go to the grocery store. And um, I realized that I, I actually left my house a lot more than I thought I did. <laughs> um, and I think that since um, things have sort of opened back up a little bit more and I'm going back to work, I've started to realize that I really haven't started leaving or I haven't started going out like for frivolous reasons as much anymore. Um, so I guess I, I started to stay home more often. Um, I also like, I pay attention to how much toilet paper I use a lot more now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like I keep an, an, a better, like a tighter inventory on my paper towels, toilet paper, paper plates, the stuff that you need to like, be sure that it's not going to get sold out at the supermarket and stuff like that. Yeah. As we saw in his lane yeah. experience at the beginning of all this. Yeah. It was so bizarre. I was like, what? I was like, what is happening? Do you think a lot of this will carry over into 2021 and beyond? Because uh, so I think kind of like, I think that the you know the pandemic is not over, right? And our cases are still increasing, um, especially in Texas. Um, and so I, I do think that there's going to be more more to coronavirus. It's not over yet. We're not in the weeds, uh, but I, I do think that it'll it'll be over eventually. Like it's just going to take more time, and they're probably going to have to. Or we'll, we'll probably have to do um, a better job the second time at locking down um, just to get this completely uh, eradicated, you know? Yeah. yeah there's, Go ahead. there's definitely been a resurgence of cases. Um, I mean, 
I'm an example of it. <laughs> and, and what's crazy, <laughs> what's crazy is too, like I've done my part the whole time. Like I always wore masks every time I went out at work and I washed my hands like crazy. Um, did all, everything right and still got it. So it was kind of like, and that's when it's like, it, it's irresponsible for other people not to do it because I didn't come in contact with guests that would not have a mask or, you know, maybe didn't clean their hands and would hand me their card. And I'm just like asking them to swipe it. They just don't get it. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll just swipe it for you then <laughs> and risk my life. <laughs> but uh, it's one thing though, being in the food industry, yeah. like you, you're not confined in an office space. Like maybe like me and Matthew would be, you're, you're with a team of other people. I mean, technically you'd be like in a kitchen or in a, a front room, but, but you're also um, seeing people constantly you know, these strangers yeah. and you don't know where they've been, what they've been doing. So like, I'm sure the food industry has been hit hard by this because of the exposure to so many people during the day. Yeah. And well, for our case, I mean, we just really buckled down on, I mean, to the point where it was annoying almost, we're like, keep your mask on, wash your hands. And we even had a timer to like, you had to wash your hands every 30 minutes at least once. I mean, people do it more usually, but uh, the minute you said, put the building, it's like, take your temperature, you know, if you have a fever go home um uh my my operator he made a joke he was like uh one of our uh one of my coworkers was on break and she had a mask off and came up to the front counter to get food and he was like abby he's like where's your mask and she's like i'm sorry and he's like and she's like i didn't think i needed it he's like oh okay he's like hey covid if you're here um <laughs> please make sure not to infect her <laughs> <laughs> which i mean just stuff like that kept it lighthearted. but at the same time it was it's just like and like all these extra precautions it's, it's kind of annoying but it's, it's definitely necessary mm -hmm. now i feel like it's one of those things that as we do go into the next year um you're going to have a, a a big lot of people that are going to continue to uh, observe all the guidelines and kind of consider what's going on then you'll have a people that a lot of people that want to move on and kind of try to force themselves back into this life which or this normal life that they, they want. And that's going to be an interesting uh, situation to be in because it seems like there's going to be like, if, if it does happen to be resolved by a vaccine or as Molly was saying, kind of like when it eventually just kind of dissipates from, from, uh, from all the, from the second lockdown. Yeah. From the second lockdown. It's like, <laughs> if, if there's going to be this like huge aftershock, you know, couple of months, almost as long as the, sh the shutdown that we've had this year into next year, that will kind of like be recovery, um, things rebuilding, uh, people getting back out, uh, industry starting back up. I know the, the entertainment industry has gotten a big giant slap in the face by this, um, you know, with it, whether it be movie theaters or concerts, like that's a whole world of of inner, like industry that has really suffered from this and and if people are going to be willing to go back out and experience stuff again that's going to really change kind of the landscape of of how we consume entertainment um how we um do daily tasks it's it's kind of weird to, to think about that but there will be an end to this eventually um so I, i'm hoping that it's sooner than later but it's one of those things where I don't think it's going to be an overnight change. Like there's going to be an aftershock <laughs> essentially. What do you think is going to happen to movie theaters? Do you think they'll still be around? Well, so we kind of talked a little bit about that in episode two with, uh, with our buddy Swade, which you know him. Oh, yeah. And I know him. <laughs> as an actor <laughs> in Hollywood, he um, kind of broke it down to the point of, you know, the industry as a whole was taking a hit. Um, whether you're on the production side or the acting side and they're going to try to keep it going because you've got streaming platforms that need content. Um, and he and he even spoke on the idea of how quickly, you know, people are trying to get content out so they can get, get it sold to these companies, uh, the streaming companies, um, which will take anything at this point, because there's going to be a huge production gap at some point that we're going to see whether it's, you know, next year or whenever, that things kind of took a halt. Um, but uh, he basically said that he thinks that movie theaters will 
become a more of a niche uh, or a niche kind of thing. Um, there will still be movie theaters. I think I think that's an industry that has to stay afloat because a lot of these studios in Hollywood rely on the theater going experience to make money and um, and to kind of keep keep the industry churning. So we may lose a few um, of the major chains, but I feel like there will still be movie theaters, um, and they may they may like shrink down um, the sizes of the auditoriums to um, kind of combat the risks but it seems as though the the movie theaters um as it feels like it's the end of it um which we kind of predicted with with streaming becoming more and more of a thing and more people watching things at home i think just just kind of accelerated that that idea of like well theaters aren't going to be around forever and people are going to be streaming at home regardless so this is just kind of like we're getting there faster, but who knows? I, I hope they stick around because I, I highly value the theater experience or even concerts. You know, I, I love being there in person and seeing a band much more than just listening to their album at home. You know, yeah. there's, it's a wild, wild thought to think that like those things could be minimized as, as prevalent as they were before all this. Yeah. Yeah. It would be crazy to lose the immersive part of, you know, going to a concert or going to see a movie, you know, because it's not like, like just putting something on your TV screen is, it's just like any other thing. It's not, it can't really be that special. But in, when, when you go to see something like in the movie theater or something like it can be an experience and it's, it's just separate, you know, it's almost like, you know, your, your brain puts it away in a separate place where it really, it's a different thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the social aspect deteriorates almost entirely. It's just like, I mean, there's no social interaction, so <laughs> it's totally different. Right. I mean, there's, there's something about going to a movie theater or a concert and sharing that experience with all the people in the room, you know, whether you're laughing, crying, you know, cheering, whatever it is, like there's a throwing up. Throwing up. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> But like there's a com- bonding experience. There's something about that combination of all those things, that communal experience that makes the media that you're watching, whether it be a concert or a movie or whatever, um, makes it ten times better than than you may have thought about it going in. You know? Uh, it'd be the difference between watching Tenet in the theater and watching Tenet for the first time on your phone. You're gonna get a completely different experience out of watching it on a big screen compared with a giant surround sound than watching on a phone with headphones in or maybe not even headphones just the phone audio and get it, i mean i don't know I'm, I'm, like I'm not that. asleep, that's that's not my that's not my thing but um but the way that kind of society has gone like it's kind of going more and more and more in that direction to the point where disney right now one of the biggest entertainment companies you know in the world has kind of taken their focus they've had to move out all their movies to next year and had to directly focus on their streaming platform it's like we have to keep creating content to go on this platform so we can get more subscribers and keep making money while our theme parks are down or running at limited capacity to kind of keep us afloat and and that's wild to think because they're you know one of the biggest companies in entertainment and they're they're having to kind of shuffle around and figure out what to do. Yeah. And then uh, concert, venues, concert venues have, you know, had a, had a big problem because there's no concerts to be had, you know, and no, the virtual concerts are cool and all, but like, like you said, Molly, there's something about the immersive experience that makes it, makes it even better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. But hopefully 2021 looks a lot better than 2020. (laughs) All right. Well, um, I think uh, we're at a point where we can wrap it up here. Um, Thank you, everyone, for for tuning in and watching this with us, either live on Facebook or on the replay on YouTube or Facebook. Um, Just make sure you uh, check us out uh, on YouTube, the Random Jam. Check us out on Facebook and um, go back and listen to all of our past episodes. We've had some great guests, including this guy here, 
Mr. Matthew Mobley. We really appreciate you coming on the show with us today. Oh yeah, enjoyed it for sure. Do you um, so so tell us uh, where people can find you, um, where they can follow you, or you know whatever you want uh, people out there to know about you or what you want to promote. Sure. Um, so you, you can follow me, find me on Instagram. Um, my handle is literally just my name, Matthew Mobley. Um, or you can Clever. find me on, on SoundCloud if you want to listen to my music. Um, I think I have a couple of accounts on there, uh, Matthew Mobley and Matthew Mobley 5. Uh, so just search for my name on SoundCloud and you'll find me there too. Nice. Very cool. All right. Well, if that is everything, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, thank you, Matthew, for being here, and you as well, Lane. Um, for all of us here, thank you so much. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time. Bye.